Is making India indeed a failure? And what are the similarities between Slovak and Indian economy? Let's find out together. Let's get into it. अब से विदेशी उत्पाद ही बाजारों में छाए रहेंगे तो वहीं अब भारत की बनी चीजें देश और दुनिया में अपना परचम फैलाएगी दुनिया के किसी भी देश में जाकर के बेचिए लेकिन निर्माण यहाँ कीजिए मैन्युफैक्चर यहाँ कीजिए वी वॉन्ट टू मेक इंडिया अ ग्लोबल मैन्युफैक्चरिंग डेस्टिनेशन दिस ऑफर टाइमली एंड यूनिक अपॉर्चुनिटी फॉर इंडस्ट्री एंड गवर्नमेंट टू वर्क टूगेदर टू मेक इंडिया ट्रूली ग्लोबली कम्पेटिव एक तरफ मैन्युफैक्चरिंग ग्रोथ को बढ़ाना है एट द सेम टाइम उसका सीधा बेनिफिट हिंदुस्तान के नौजवानों को मिले उसे रोजगार मिले और उसका परचेविंग पावर बढ़े तो मैन्युफैक्चरिंग की संख्या बढ़ेगी मैन्युफैक्चरिंग का ग्रोथ बढ़ेगा द चैलेंज वॉज टू रिवर्स द ट्रेंड एंड प्रोवाइड मोमेंटम एनर्जी एंड अ सिंगल माइंडेड कमिटमेंट टू ग्रोथ ये एक ऐसा चक्र है उस चक्र को आगे बढ़ाने की दिशा में एक महत्वपूर्ण काम आज ये लाइन का स्टेप Hi everybody Make in India was one of the most ambitious initiatives of the BJP and it's been 10 years since Make in India was launched Prime Minister Modi today launched a Make in India campaign Automobile se lekar ke Agro valuation ta come make in India The imprint of Make in India initiative has become visible across sectors including areas where we never ever dreamt of making an impact Back then it was bragged as the policy that would change the face of India and turn us into a manufacturing powerhouse But the question is did it really happen A decade long journey has propelled India to become a global manufacturing hub India is not yet among the top 5 nations which have increased their share of exports in major labor intensive sectors I think in some areas we've done a lot as I said infrastructure we've done a lot that's been very useful but we need to check the other places Sachai hai ki Modi ji ka make in India fail ho gaya hai Look at this In the last decade India's manufacturing has increased by 5.5% and today india is manufacturing everything from smartphones to solar panels to semiconductor chips to electric vehicles you name it and we make it in india so it all looks absolutely fantastic right but what if i told you that make in india is actually a failure pradhan mantri ji make in india ki baat karte hain punjab ka jo kisan hai shayad usse zyada make in india koi karta nahi इसने देश को खड़ा किया है क्या जो गरीब मेक इन इंडिया करता है वो मेक इन इंडिया नहीं होता है वो मेक मेक इन कुछ और होता है ये मेक इन इंडिया देश के लिए है हा सफल नहीं हुआ तो सफल होने के लिए क्या करना चाहिए सफल होने में क्या कमियां हैं उसकी चर्चा होनी चाहिए लुक इट दिस Make in India was started with four important objectives. Firstly, we wanted to decrease our dependence on imports. And have they decreased? Well, yes, but not significantly. If we see the imports as a percentage of our GDP, in 2013-14 it was 25.95%, but by 2023 it only went down to 23.96%. So it has slightly decreased. Secondly, through manufacturing, the government of India in 2014 set a target to achieve manufacturing growth rate of 12 to 14%. But if we see this table, we are far far away from achieving this target. Only in 2015 we were able to achieve this kind of growth rate, and in 2019. it was minus 2.4% and if we see the last 10 years which is 10 years into this initiative manufacturing growth in fact has slowed down to 5.5% and its gdp share remains stagnant at 15 to 17% which is again far far away from the government's target of 25% then we wanted to increase our exports did they increase yes Look at this. Our exports have grown almost twice. India's exports in 2014 stood at 317.45 billion dollars, but as of 2023, it stood at 776.68 billion dollars. But the catch over here is that the objective of Make in India was not just to increase exports, it was to increase exports as compared to our imports. 
but did it increase well not really look at this as of 2014 india spent 32.4 billion dollars more on imports and outward payments than its earning from exports and inward payments but by 2024 this number stood at 54.5 billion dollars thirdly through make in india we wanted companies all around the world to invest billions of dollars with foreign direct investment and FDI was supposed to shoot up in India. But did it really shoot up? Not at all. Look at this chart. While the gross investment by foreign companies has shot up from $46 billion to $71 billion, at the same time, the gross disinvestment has increased from $13.6 billion to $44.4 billion. So in short, more money is going out of India than it is coming to India. Despite all the rara, strongest growing, the large economy in the world, etc., etc., the fact is the economy is not working for many of our viewers. India's share in the global economy, export share, is very minimal. It's just about 1.5%. And therefore, India needs to work hard to penetrate global markets. The integration of India into the global economy would have been on a more superior base if this initiative had succeeded. Sadly, the Make in India program never really took off the way it was meant to be. And lastly, while we aim to employ 100 million people in manufacturing, today we have barely employed 18.4 million people. Hundreds of applicants, just a handful of openings. Sites like this one have become commonplace in India. Around 30% graduates in India cannot find a job. It's among the highest rates globally. It's very difficult to see today's situation. After graduation, we stay here and stay here, but we don't get a job. This is the reason why Make in India, according to the stats, has failed to a large extent. Not fully, but to a large extent. Now, the moment we say this, the left will say that it is all BJP's fault. And the right will argue that Modi ji is a legend and no matter what the stats say, BJP has done more for India than Congress. But the truth of the matter is that it's not about BJP or Congress, but the Indian system itself which has some viruses that are causing this failure. And no matter which party is in power, if we don't solve these fundamental issues, we will keep failing. So as responsible citizens, the right question to ask is not whether BJP has succeeded or not, but why has India not succeeded? And why is India not succeeding? At the same time, the left media always keeps blaming without understanding the reasoning. So today, on the occasion of 10 years of Make in India, we read through hundreds of pages of research reports and stats so that we could uncover the most important problems that are holding India behind. And in this episode, we are also featuring some of the most important points made by great leaders of our country like Shashi Tharoor, Nirmala Ma'am and even Nitin Gadkari sir. So in this episode today, let's do a deep dive and try to understand why exactly is Make in India failing? What are the biggest underlying governance issues that are failing our manufacturing dream? How is it costing us thousands of crores in losses? And most importantly, what are the solutions that we need to work on to make India succeed in the 21st century? Chalo, let's start by understanding why exactly is Make in India so so important and why are we so crazy about manufacturing everything in India? Why can't we just import and chill and why don't we just focus on our service industry which is growing at a very rapid pace? Well, that is because ladies and gentlemen, manufacturing brings in three important superpowers to our economy as compared to the service-based economy. Firstly, if you look at service industries like IT services, they can largely provide jobs only to skilled and at max semi-skilled people. Whereas if you look at manufacturing industries like textile, they can provide jobs to all kinds of people, whether they are skilled, semi-skilled or unskilled people. And semi-skilled and unskilled people alone form more than 50% of our population, which is why employing them is very, very important. And if you look at the difference in their employment capability, it will blow your mind. For example, while the IT industry contributes 7.5% to our GDP, the textile sector barely contributes 2.3%. But if you look at the employment that they provide, while the IT services industry employs only 5.43 million people, mm. our textile industry alone employs 45 million people. So everybody from a skilled engineer to an uneducated clerk can get a job in manufacturing. So manufacturing industries help us uplift the people from the poverty line and they help us bring them to a sustainable standard of living. Secondly, while the services are prone to more economic shocks, 
manufacturing industries relatively i repeat relatively experience less shocks for example while the financial services industry and the marketing services industry took a massive hit during the 2008 recession companies like nestle procter and gamble and hindustan unilever were not as badly affected because if you look at the fundamental change in the industry while people could cut down on their spending on financial services and marketing services they could not cut down on essentials like razors detergents and baby foods and lastly while manufacturing is easily scalable to increase exports scaling a service company is relatively very very difficult so employment scale and resistance are the three superpowers that manufacturing sector brings to our economy and then comes the last reason for manufacturing which is specific to india which is to decrease our imports and to increase our exports and currently our economy is practically bleeding because of increasing imports and while most people think imports don't impact our economy here's a very simple three part answer as to why increasing imports is bad for the indian economy firstly imports kill domestic industries and they cause job losses here in india and the best example for the same is the solar panel industry If you saw our solar case study we saw how the chinese vendors are providing solar panels at such dirt cheap cost that no indian company other than vari energies is actually able to stand against them and because of this the solar industry of india is finding it very hard to progress similarly when chinese phones flooded the indian market micromax and lava like companies went out of business now some people over here may argue that they were terrible phones and they did not make great products at all but the truth of the matter over here is that in the electronics market It takes time to build a great product but once created they could create a 1000 crore economic impact every single year. Secondly, imports cause a trade deficit and they decrease the value of our currency. So if India imports products worth 100 billion dollars and exports only 70 billion dollars worth of products this deficit of 30 billion dollars will push us to buy more US dollars. And because of this what happens? We will need 30 billion in US dollars because of which the demand for US dollar increases. And when the demand for US dollar increases, the dollar value will shoot up and the rupee value will go down. And now what is 80 rupees to the dollar will become 90 rupees to the dollar in no time. And if this happens, then a barrel of oil which we are buying currently at 6000 rupees a barrel it will shoot up to 8000 rupees a barrel simply because of the dollar conversion and because of this petrol cost will shoot up production cost will shoot up and hence inflation will shoot up in india and lastly the current account deficit causes a dent in our economics so this 30 billion dollar deficit after a certain point will require us to take up loans which will again increase our expenses this is the reason why in 2014 under the make in india initiative the modi government set a goal to increase the manufacturing share of gdp from 15% in 2014 to 25% in 2022 and then it got revised to 2025 due to the pandemic so this begs the question when we have a government that is so passionate about manufacturing when we have a government that is introducing so many schemes to decrease taxes and invite businesses when modi ji himself is asking businesses to come to india with tax breaks and land banks where are we failing we have a large population we have a government that is aggressive and capitalistic and so many businesses as it is want to move out of china then the question is what exactly is the problem well one of the biggest roadblocks to indian development is red tapeism and indian bureaucracy because of which even today india is a very difficult place to do business in and this is something that even shashi sir mentioned in our podcast processes of government Every file requires four or five signatures in a particular order of sequence. If one guy is on leave or sick or traveling somewhere on duty or whatever, the file just sits until he comes back and signs that file. It's no surprise then that when Modi takes office, he is given it a free hand in an effort to cut red tape. हमने लाइसेंस परमिट राज को जड़ से खत्म करने का प्रण लिया. We had to cut red tape. Red tape. interesting that's a similarity with slovakia we also have a lot of obviously me living out of the country for so long in the uk where everything is just so easy coming to slovakia we have an electronic signature for our ids and honestly like whenever you want to sign anything the system is so complicated and i watched a video on this as well where they were really trashing how bad it, badly it was done that you'd rather go to an office to do that in person because yeah um literally i don't know about india curious to know they are obsessed in slovakia with stamping documents i don't know why 
but it's an obsession. It never happens in the UK. Everything seems to work just fine. But in Slovakia, for everything, you need a stamp and a signature. Stamp and a signature. Like it's a business stamp. It blows my mind. It blows my mind. And I think that uh, Slovakia is also not competitive, similarly to India, on, on those kind of red tape or like bureaucracy. I feel like there is a um, an effort. I think that every government gradually is trying to, to lower that. But me coming from a country where things just, I feel like, work, it's just like, are you kidding me? But let's continue. <laughs> Long story short, setting up a business in India involves multiple stages from company registration to obtaining regulatory approvals to even acquiring a land is a very, very oh, tedious wow. task in India. While registering a company in India can take around 15 to 30 days through electronic system, the entire process of setting up operations including land acquisition, environmental clearances, construction and obtaining the necessary permits, all of these processes can take anywhere between 1.5 to 5 long years. On the other hand, if you look at Vietnam, it takes approximately 6 months in 2024 as compared to 3 to 4 months in 2019. This duration includes the time from selecting a location to the actual commencement of the operation. So do you understand the gravity of the situation? If a business expects to make 10 lakh rupees in revenue per day, a delay of just one month in India would result in a loss of 3 crore rupees and 36 crore rupees in a month and a year respectively. And for big businesses, this could even mean hundreds of crores in losses. Now you tell me, if you have the option to set up a business in Vietnam, would you even consider India? No, right? In fact, in 2019, Elon Musk casually mentioned in a tweet about coming to India next year. And now it's been five long years and nothing has changed. And if you look at what exactly is the problem, you will see that in 2021, India's import tariffs for EVs was as high as 100%, which could have costed $40,000 for an Indian buyer. That is around 32 lakh rupees. So Elon Musk asked the government to let Tesla sell cars in India without manufacturing in India so that they can test the Indian markets by selling imported cars. And after they reach a certain scale, they would consider manufacturing in India. But the Indian government didn't want that at all. India wanted Tesla to set up their own factory instead of selling imported cars in India. And mm -hmm. fast forward to three years later, neither the government has agreed nor has Tesla. If the young, young Musk is ready to manufacture a Tesla in India, there is no problem. <laughs> we have got the all competency, the vendors are available. We have got the all type of technology. And because of that, he can reduce the cost. But our request to him is that you come to India, start manufacturing here. India is a huge market. The export availability, everything, ports are available. He can make their export from India. And he is welcome. He is welcome in India. We don't have any problem. Now, who's right, who's wrong, you decide. But what I know for sure is that if we prevent companies like Tesla from entering India, we are missing out on a huge opportunity both in terms of taxes and in terms of employment for the people of India. This is the first problem that we have. The second problem that we have is of environmental clearances. And this is literally blocking the growth of infrastructure and is hindering businesses from starting operations in India. In fact, this is something that even Gadkari sir mentioned in our podcast. <laughs> Land नहीं थी, utility shifting नहीं था, decision नहीं होते थे, railway clearances नहीं थी, बैंकों में account MPA बन गए, काम बंद पड़ा, वो कर्जे के बोझे में contractor फंस गया, ऐसे अनेक reasons हैं. So do you understand the gravity of this problem? In fact, in recent times, the Delhi Metro's Lajpat Nagar to Sakeji block corridor, it has been delayed by at least six months. And what was to be completed in 2024 is being pushed to 2025. And in Gujarat, it is absolutely unbelievable that over 1,000 projects have been delayed due to environmental approvals in August 2024. This is the second problem that we have that is slowing down the growth of our economy. And then we come to the third problem, which is the biggest problem of all, which is called land acquisition. For those who don't know, in India, if you want to acquire land for industrial purposes or for highways, it can take years due to legal dispute, compensation issues and approvals from various government departments and it affects both international businesses and domestic infrastructure projects. And the best example of this is of a company called POSCO. POSCO is a South Korean steel company that wanted to come to India and they announced plans to invest $12 billion in a steel plant in Odisha back in 2005. And this would have been one of the biggest foreign direct investments in India. But guess what? 
the project faced a massive delay for 10 long years and this was because of land acquisition and environmental clearances so local residents refused to give up their land and after 2017 which is after more than a decade of struggle POSCO decided to scrap the project and move out of India. POSCO stalled project to build a steel mill in the Indian state of Odisha. The biggest foreign direct investment ever in India is yet to take off. The project was launched in 2005 but has been delayed for roughly 9 years due to land acquisition issues and environmental concerns. The largest foreign direct investment project POSCO is paralyzed by protesters who are determined not to allow the takeover of their land. In fact, let alone foreign companies even in India's own infrastructure projects have been suffering due to land acquisition processes and the best example for this is Bharat Mala 34800 km ke rajmarg banane ke liye 2015 mein jis Bharat Mala pariyojana ko shuru kiya gaya tha uske tahat ab tak sirf 23 faisad hi kaam pura ho sakta hai but in 2023 the ministry actually increased the cost to 32 crore rupees per kilometer for 26316 km The Bharat Mala Phase 1 project which was originally supposed to be completed by 2022 it is now being delayed to 2027 and because of this delay the cost has doubled from 5.35 lakh crores to 10.63 lakh crores and this is happening because of land acquisition problem and the rising material costs secondly the most famous project of india that the government is absolutely proud of is the mumbai ahmedabad bullet train project but even this project was expected to finish by 2023 and as usual due to delays in land acquisition its completion has been pushed to 2028 and if you look at the cost it has increased from 1.08 lakh crores to nearly 2 lakh crore rupees in fact this is something that even nirmala ma'am mentioned in our podcast after all the same bullet train was approved in maharashtra as well but what happened with a change of government that particular agreement or understanding was put in the back burner but if you look at vietnam They have streamlined land acquisition policies to such an extent that Samsung was able to get certificate in 2008 and they set up a massive smartphone manufacturing plant in 2009 itself. And as of today, Samsung has invested 22 billion dollars in Vietnam. You know how much money that is? 22 billion dollars is equivalent to 3.5 times of Reliance's biggest oil refinery of Jamnagar. And here in India, you would be shocked to know that around 70%, I repeat, 70% of our infra projects get delayed and i also read this shocking fact that on an average as of august 2022 these projects were running behind by over 41 months which is almost 3 and a half years of delay this is how land acquisition and environmental certifications are paralyzing the growth of india if this is clear to you let's come to another big problem which is our infrastructure issue here we have rail road trains and ports all of which are in terrible conditions in india as compared to the international standards for example while the average speed of a goods train in india is 25 km per hour in china it is 45 km per hour so our goods trains are literally moving slower than a freaking activa i'll attach a complete case study on this in the description so that you can understand this problem better if this is clear to you let's come to roads did you know that in india trucks travel at an average speed of 20 to 40 km per hour meaning it can take anywhere between 2 to 3 days to cover 400 to 600 km in distance but in china it is 60 km per hour and even in vietnam it stands at 40 to 60 km per hour then let's come to ports even though india has a longer coastline and more ports than vietnam the average turnaround time for vessels at the mumbai port in india was more than 2 days whereas for the saigon port in ho chi minh city it was just around 0.9 days or 21.6 hours so ships in vietnam move twice as fast while coming and going out to the ports as compared to india similarly on an average shipping containers spend 22 days on the depot while in vietnam they just spend 9 days and this difference of 13 days increases the transportation cost for companies by billions of dollars and if you compare india's port capacity to that of china China has 7 out of the top 10 ports in the world and India's JNPT which is our top port it is at the 35th spot and while ports in China could handle 1.17 billion tons of goods back in 2020 India's largest port which is the Mundra port can only handle 180 million metric tons of cargo per annum so practically our ports are nowhere close to the capacity and speed of Vietnam and China our trucks are slower and our goods trains run slower than an activa 
and even if the government wants to build ports the problem is that because of land acquisition and environmental clearance issues 70% of our central infrastructure projects get delayed due to clearance and approvals and even if the government wants to speed up these infrastructure projects the problem is that because of land acquisition issues and environmental clearance issues 70% of central infrastructure projects get delayed this is the fourth problem that we have and lastly we have a skill problem and a labor problem and you would be shocked to know that only 2% of india's workforce holds a certificate proving mastery of a professional skill and in comparison for south korea this number stands at 96% for japan it stands at 80% and China stands at 40%. In fact, even Vietnam stands at 12%. Now, while the government did try to fix it through Skill India initiative, the reality is that only 5% of India's workforce has received formal skills training. And as we all know, India's formal education system is so pathetic that as per the Skill India report of 2024, 35% of our BTEC graduates are unemployed, 77% of our polytechnic graduates are unemployed, and 60% of our ITI graduates are unemployed. And all these problems together, they cause the biggest problem of all, which is unemployment. And like I said before, while the government set the objective of creating 100 million jobs by 2022, so far there are only 18.4 million jobs in manufacturing. And the deadline now has been revised to 2025. And to be very honest, I don't even think we'll be able to achieve this number in 2025. This is the situation of the Indian manufacturing dream. So it is not a complete failure but it is a failure to a large, large extent and we have very less to cheer about. So this begs the question, what exactly is the solution? Well, surprisingly, the solutions are pretty straightforward and here are five simple solutions that the government needs to implement in the next five years. Firstly, we need to solve for foreign investment through better ease of doing business laws. And if you need a separate video on this, drop a comment below and we'll make a separate video on how India can improve its ease of doing business. Secondly, we need to solve for land acquisition with a land banking system just like Gujarat has solved for it. And we have made a detailed case study on the Gujarat model, which you can check out from the link in the description. Thirdly, we need to have a far better infrastructure, which again requires land banks and it requires a better system for environmental clearance. And lastly, we need to solve for labor and upskilling, which India has solved for, but hasn't scaled enough all across the country. This is what you need to understand about the manufacturing dream of India, which the government of India is calling Make in India. And I just hope you learned something valuable from this case study. That's all from my side for today, guys. If you learned something valuable, please make sure to hit the like. Well, well, well. So I guess the first question is, what do you guys think? Is Make India indeed a failure as it's been presented in, the, in today's video? I Before I tell you what I actually think, I want to tell you that it's scary how much I see similarities between India and Slovakia. Now, some people are, get very upset uh, for me comparing the countries. But um, I see the patterns. I'm not saying we're exactly the same. Obviously, Slovakia is a small country. But to me, they're striking, especially what he named here. I was smiling the entire time. I was like, this is exactly what's happening here. So I'll talk about it one by one. But before we do, um, he was talking a lot about unemployment. And I wanted to check with you because, and I'll try to share a screen. Give me a second. I have, I have this one because when I was in India, it felt like, you know, there is a lot of, um, unemployment but then we check with my friend and India unemployment rate is only 4.8 percent and it's declined from uh, uh, let's go to macro trends so accept all whatever you see so India unemployment rate is continuously on decline so it's not a huge unemployment rate so this is why I've always been wondering was with the unemployment in India and uh, why why are people not being employed? So please do let me know your thoughts on this one because to me it doesn't seem so great. But when I had my boots on the ground, it felt like yeah that um, 
one job and perhaps uh, I was joking about it. Like I felt like for one job, you need three people in India. And this is an interesting thing because when he was talking about manufacturing, so um, the, the large population of India is unskilled. Uh, I, I guess there is still a huge uh, uh, illiteracy, illiteracy rate in India. Uh, 2024, uh, so literacy rate was only 76% in 2022. So it is still like an increase, they say, from 2012. Uh, but it is still basically uh, leaving, you know, a lot of population. It's almost 30%. Um, illiterate, which is a huge amount of population. So this is why uh, I understand why the manufacturing for the people and uh, the the it's, I don't know, you will always have to, and I think manufacturing brings more benefits in a, in a country than, um, than just employment on unskilled people. Um, but uh, I understand where this is coming from, and I understand the initiative for skilling people. Now, um, let me take you through the similarities I see. So, India has been independent for many more years than Slovakia. I think India, you, you guys said uh, India... India independence. I think it's you say it was 70, 70 years. So India uh, has been independent for around that time. How many uh, been independent? So completely 77 years of independence. How many years has Slovakia? Uh, yeah. So Basically, um, we have, you know, only been, I think, independent for around uh, 30, 40 years. I don't know. My maths is not very good. Um, but, uh, but the point is, basically, um, the similarities that I see between India and India um, and Slovakia are as follows. So when we gain our independence, uh, it was by splitting two countries, you guys split as well, right? Um, similarities, if you like it. We did not have a split based off a religion or it was in any way violent, but it was a split nonetheless. It was a split when Czech people took everything and Slovak people were like foot garbage. I know with firsthand of uh, military people that I know. Okay, so uh, that that's kind of how the division of Czechoslovakia has happened. They stole many things. Um, and um, historically, Slovakia, just like India, have been under the... Uh, I like to say we were slave to other nations and, uh, you know, you were also governed by the lovely British. You had Mughals, etc. So we've been, Slovakia has been enslaved for a thousand years. I say Slovakia because some crazy people in the comments say like, how dare you talk about it? I'm like, dude, I'm talking about my own country. So chill. Okay. Um, so... So we have similarity, which which breeds in my head a very similar mentality. So Slovakia is very family oriented. India is also very family oriented. Obviously, we have exceptions now uh, since we've been westernized um, by like the major cities. But Slovakia is still very much family orientated. Um, so the mentality is like, I just want to do a job and go to my family. I want my wife to bake for me. I just want to go to family celebration. And that's kind of what the life in Slovakia is actually really about. I, I, I presume very similar. Now, because Slovakia has been historically hungerized for a, literally, when you when I see in the comments like, oh, you should know about India, you should know about stuff, is basically what has, ha what has been happening since 19th century. Slovakia has been, and wait for this, 
hungerized by Slovak people. You would not, you cannot make this shit up. The worst hungerizators in the history. In fact, Hungarian national hero is Slovak. Okay, and based on the latest research of DNA, basically Hungarians are Slovaks because the history has been lovely twisted, etc. Et but, you know, there was in the 19th century the Hungarization and they were really genocide. The Hungarians were really genociding Slovak people. You had some similar fun stuff on your end as well, you know, stripping people of the knowledge, etc. So, um, you know, you could, uh, you would be, um, you know, kicked out of school uh, if you were signing just in Slovak, if you were speaking Slovak, if uh, they were also shooting people, uh, you had to go, you know, um, in churches, the sermons were like, they were forcing you to listen to Hungarian. And um, uh, literally, they could accuse you of uh, like um, being Panslav, which is, I think, a propagator of Slavism, uh, and kicked out of the school. So they were systematically trying to eradicate Slovak people. So as a result of that, and also in your similar story with the British, you have uh, lots of similar things happening to you. You are kind of losing the consciousness of the nations. You are losing your skill and heritage, etc. So you end up with having a very, and I don't mean any offense by that, a lot of very simple people who are just happy that they are actually alive. Okay. And then just want to focus on the family and have family life. Um, literally, they were putting Slovak, like top Slovak people in the prisons. They were giving them fines that they could actually never even pay. It was crazy what was happening. And, and basically, the hungerization for us really didn't stop until even formation of our republic. We had Hungarian party, pretty much first time in Slovak history that we did not have a Hungarian party in Slovak parliament has been four years ago. Four years ago. So we're talking 2020, okay? Um, so... There are different, like people perhaps were not that educated clearly because we were systematically cut out from that. And that leads to a lot of example, like um, a lack of skills, a lack of education, uh, just very simple people who can only do unskilled work. Okay. And, um, and then, you know, as we have gone on the way of capitalism and perhaps maybe and but you correct me if i'm wrong i'm just making assumptions okay so don't come for me um uh, but you can help me to clarify my thinking in the comments capitalism when i always say that when capitalism enters slovakia it, um it implemented a sick form of capitalism now suddenly because you have all these poor, uneducated people, majority, okay, uh, you have very less educated people, um, everyone just wanted to be rich, everyone just jumped on the horse in Bratislava, in the capital, and when the, the gates opened, they stole everything, and there has been implemented mafia and large amounts of corruption, so I would wonder what happened in India. But I also understand that in, there is a lot of uh, amount of corruption in India. So why? Uh, because, you know, um, you are suppressed for so long. So psychologically, you want to be better than other people. And you want to get rich quick scheme. But when you look at the people in the West, like Warren Buffet, or like very, uh, like rich families, they have acquired their wealth over generations. But some, in Slovakia, at least, everyone wanted to be a billionaire overnight. So then you start owning certain contracts all over the country. And that's how you come to money. You're not necessarily well educated, well mannered. And you're just a literally mean person. <laughs> it's just there for the money. And now it would not surprise me, although I feel like with Hinduism, you guys could have maybe better mentality uh, for that. But, you know, no one is immune to a human nature. Once you've been suffering for so long, you just want things good for yourself and your family. And sometimes it costs, you don't care. Okay, so this is why you have uh, we have extreme bureaucracy. You have bureaucracy. I feel like in Slovakia it's getting better. I'm sure progressively on India is getting better, but it's, you know India is like a million times bigger than Slovakia. So, 
So these are um, these are the things. Now, another similarity that I see from this video between Slovakia and India is I was laughing at this the environmental thing. Jesus Christ, our country has not been developing because of the exact same things, you guys, that India has not been developing for, which is the environmental clearances and the dam um, land acquisitions. So environment, I've been told by many, it's it's been just literally... People love, oh, that there are two precious frogs sitting somewhere on the way to build a highway, and it extends for three to five years. So um, the Slovak infrastructure, which was supposed to have been built by 10, 10 years ago, is still not finished. And uh, the other day I was listening about one really cl very critical um, kind of tunnel, which it's already for set, it's been bad. And every year it's the, the traffic around the town is getting worse and worse because it's a main kind of um, road from east to the west and it's just a disaster and how they're saying they're going to extend it by another year i was like shoot me now this is insanity literally but it's um it's a lot of environmental things and then we have to um realize that we are people i i think that people on and do not understand that we are people. That when you look at people in governments, they are people like you and I. You want to, you want your workday to finish. You want to spend you and your family. You get sick, you get angry, you get frustrated. Um, you have your desires, and you are not always able to get give, um, you know, three million percent. And then you look at your pay. And perhaps your pay is not as great, so you're like, F it, you know, why am I going to do a typical uneducated, low-skill worker mentality is like, I just want to do nine to five, you know? It's, um, it's like, I don't understand because when I'm working and I'm sure that, you know, like sewing machines and all that kind of stuff perhaps is not more most purposeful work, but, um, you know, you can think about it like, you know, with every clothes I make, I dress another person. There it gives, it gives a purpose, but people do it just, at least in Slovakia, I don't know how it is in India, but here people just like want to be done with work. I feel like people don't like to work. I feel like there is a part of Slovak population that really does enjoy to work. Um, but then there is like these low skill workers, they just want to go to to home and they just, you know, they, they complain that they don't get paid enough. I'm like, but you're not providing any value, you're just there, you know, for the number. Uh, and you know, what do you expect, right? Like, I feel like there is not this um, mentality, and I wonder if it's the same in India, when just think about, like, what value are you providing to people? Like, why? <laughs> and that's that's a huge thing. And then when unemployment, when we were talking earlier about unemployment, uh, I mean, like, throwing three people to do the same job is a disaster of its own. I don't understand, <laughs> you know, when I said, like, I felt like one person, to, to get my change, I there had to be three men involved. I, I was stunned in India. I was like, I can't, like, I can't. Because the thing is, like, once you overemploy people, you are, it feels like communism. In communism, everyone had a job, which on one hand was good, but on the other hand, communism was not sustainable. Um, so you force people to work, but there was no value, like you're doing unimportant tasks. So I mean, at least three, okay, the people to do something else, you know, just make it make sense. You cannot, you cannot put five people to do one person's job. It doesn't work. Like this is against any common sense thinking innovation. This is only going to be your detriment because it's just a, a bubble that's going to explode. Now, so we've talked about delayed environmental thing. It's, it's a normal thing in Slovakia. Another thing that we have in common is the land acquisition, blind me. So Slovakia was under Hungarian law and Czech Republic, for example, was under Austrian law which for the land, which kind of trans, transpired into the countries, which meant that in Czech Republic, um, your inheritance is just on the first born person. In Slovakia, it splits among everyone, which... I guess it's nice for people, but what it's nice, nice about, because people were getting lands and you need to build infrastructure, you need to build everything, okay? Now, uh, because of that, 
Um, there, there, there were cases in the TV where people just basically were bargaining with the government where they didn't want to sell their land, and it's stopping the process. So, um, of of doing that because you have to go through a certain process, certain days, and blah 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 blah, and that's uh, that is indeed happening in Slovakia. So another commonality here. Now, um, when he started to talk about railers, trains, and bridges. Now that I'm back in this country, what they talk about is exactly the same thing. I'm like, where the heck have you been for the entire 30 years since the country has been born? And uh, now they're like, you know, our bridges are falling apart. We need to fix our railroads. I'm like, are you kidding me? You gotta be kidding me because people are corrupt and they steal. Like, I don't believe we have in Slovakia, normal politicians, but I don't know what the normal politicians would be anymore. I feel like everyone steals and everyone lies. And we have the exact same problems that they are trying now to fix. Um, Dave, actually, we have intercity between our two biggest cities, which is Bratislava and Košice, is the opposite parts of the country. And now they actually stop running the intercity trains and they are going to put more trains, but they're not going to be the fast trains. I'm like, you gotta be shitting me. Um, also, they, and they are now pu putting like a fly between Bratislava and Košice, uh, which is, you know, the two biggest cities, so the capital and the second biggest city, which honestly does not help most of the people. It will just only help people in those cities because you know how much harder it is just to get to the airport because they're effing always far, far away from everything. Guys, I do not understand. <laughs> I do not understand. But as you can see, we do have the very same uh, issue. Skilled people, I still feel like in Slovakia, there is a lot of unskilled people. And I think it's going to bite this country in the ass. This is why we have a lot of... Uh, they, the, the current government, which was in power for 10 years before, has made Slovakia a car manufacturing thing. And um, yes, you absolutely do need to look for opportunities for unskilled workers, but the, the future is so far ahead that even that is like barely sustainable. I don't know, like not everyone can be uh, educated. And I don't think that the value of a person should be determined based on uh, what school they went to or or you know what the job they do because a trash man is equally as important as prime minister in my head like if we didn't have trash people i cannot imagine where we would be living okay and i don't appreciate when people look at things that way so at the end of the day it's all about the people we need to realize that we are driving a lot of things without actually not realizing it so the question is just i think it was jfk kennedy which asked americans what can you do for your country but if there is not a well of a people if they just want to be with their family and don't do much and slack there is not that much hope right and it's just all about individual people because even politicians are individual people you need to look at them through the lens of the individual people like how would you act and how would you react when you're in the office but you will not know because you don't know what kind of pressures they have gone through um because unless you have been let's say in a senior role for example i have been and people are acting all smart about that like, oh you should have done this or done that but i'm like dude you don't know half of the thing that i know so no it's not possible so this is why it's not okay when people judge and talk about things they have no idea about so i would really really you know challenge you to think about when you're passing judgments or thinking about um you know other people and in their position etc um differently you know like i don't think you should judge a person until you day you walk the day in in their shoes but i think what we can do is to start with us start with our beliefs the way we want to show up in this world to make the world a better place and uh, i think um i know you guys don't really like gandhi but be the change you wish to see in the world is exactly what needs to happen and i think as 
as much as people start realizing that they need to change, things will eventually change. And with that being said, thank you so much for listening to this big run. I hope my comparison between India and Slovakia has helped and realize how actually the countries or mentalities might be similar. And I hope to see you in the next one. Until then, please do take care. I am sending lots of love.